Is your slumber haunted by demons from the waking world? Do you find yourself changing your sheets more often than getting a good night's sleep? <laughs> Let's face it, do you have a disposable income? Well, come on down to Dr. Holly Sticks Klonoa Goa Dreama Emporium, your one-stop shop for dream analysis goodness. Hi, Dr. Hollivander Stick here. Did you know that dreams are important? Well, they are. According to these two guys, they're a look into our deepest thoughts in our subconscious minds. And they should know what they're talking about since he's friends with your mom and he really likes Persona. At my Klonoa Goa Dreama Emporium, we use a mix of NASA looking technology co-opted Hawaiian and Native American culture to make things look spiritual, and a dangerous dosage of sleeping pills in order to send you to dreamland. Just not the one that's legally owned by Nintendo and HAL Laboratories. No, no, no. This is a different dreamland spelt with two Ds that is very similar, but, but not the one owned by Nintendo and HAL Laboratories. I can't stress that enough. Please do not cease and desist. Please. With the help of my staff of board certified nerd looking types and a little pseudoscience I won't bore you with, we're able to get to the bottom of what your dreams mean. Something that's long since been considered to be deeply personal and up for interpretation, even by the research that we quote in front of you. Don't believe me? Well, here's a few choice words from a few of our happy customers. You know, back in my day, dreams are just a funny little way to make sense of my borderline psychopathic behavior. But thanks to the good doctor, well, now I can justify my actions before I commit them. Dr. Holly Stick is a godsend, like literally. He interpreted one of my dreams and helped me realize as much. I can't get enough of this clink. Meow. <laughs> Uh, see, we're completely above board and credible. In fact, we're so credible that the Better Business Bureau has a pending investigation into just how good we are. So come on down to Dr. Holly Stick's Klonoa Goa Dreama Emporium, where we diagnose the nebulose and make you feel grandiose. For a price, of course. So I've been feeling a bit lost in life lately, and as such, I decided to get some help and visit my local dream clinic with the hope of figuring things out. They helped me realize that this recurrent dream I've been having about stealing the Mona Lisa and fashioning it into a hang glider to use after leaping off Mount Kilimanjaro has... Well, it turns out that this dream has been about critiquing art the whole time and how a dozen different people can look at the same piece of work and extract wildly different meanings from it, and how building off of that it's okay to look at something that's wildly beloved and to feel a little differently about it than other people. How it's okay to critique good things and find the flaws in them. Or that I just really want to go hang gliding. And that the curtains are blue. Released in 1997, Klonoa Dorta Phantom Isle is a 2.5D platformer for the PlayStation. In it, you take control of the titular character Klonoa as he goes on an adventure to rid the dreamland of Phantom Isle of the evil Gadius, who's trying to turn the world into a land of nightmares. Welcome to the Apocalypse, Mr. Developed and published by Namco, the game was directed by Hideo Yoshizawa, who's best known for his work on the original Ninja Gaiden games for the NES. In the mid-to-late 90s, Yoshizawa grew interested in creating a cinematic platformer that featured more storytelling than what had long been standard in the genre. Originally envisioned as a serious story focusing on robots and ancient ruins, the idea for Klonoa eventually transformed into one revolving around the concept of a world where the dreams of the waking world went after people had woken up. After settling on the concept for the game, a lighter and more cartoony tone quickly took shape within it, and Namco would show some faith in the project due to what they believed was the wide appeal of its premise, turning Klonoa into something of an attempt at a mascot platformer for the company a few years before the development and release of the first Pac-Man world. Upon its release, Klonoa received rave reviews, with critics like Ron Dullin from GameSpot praising its visuals and lack of repetitive gameplay. Similarly, IGN would go on to give the title their Editor's Choice Award and even claim that Klonoa was, quote, arguably the best platformer on the market. Quote, unquote. And as if that weren't enough, the game would even land in the 19th spot in the independent PlayStation magazine PSM's 1998 list of the best PlayStation games. 
frankly, the greatest criticism that the game would go on to receive back in the 90s was that it was just a bit too cute and childish for its own good. It'd go on to receive sequels for the Wonderswan Color, the PlayStation 2, and the Game Boy Advance, as well as a remake for the Nintendo Wii that's set to get re-released this July bundled with a remake of the PS2 sequel, Klonoa 2, Lunatis Veil, on the Nintendo Switch, with the release for other platforms forthcoming in the future. But does it hold up? Even though Klonoa is a bit of a beloved character these days, I didn't actually grow up playing many of his games outside of Empire of Dreams for the Game Boy Advance. And even though I remember enjoying that game, I honestly forgot that Klonoa even existed as a character until Namco announced that he was getting a couple of remasters on the Nintendo Switch. And because of that upcoming remaster, I decided it'd be worth checking out Door to Phantom Isle on the PlayStation and its 2008 Wii make to see whether or not the game was worth revisiting. While I was a little apprehensive towards basically playing this game twice in a row before another version hits the market, especially since the upcoming Fantasy Reverie series release is going to feature a remaster of the Wii version to begin with, and because I just went a little cuckoo playing three versions of Final Fantasy 1 for my last video, I was genuinely surprised by how easy and somewhat enjoyable it was to go through this game multiple times. Now, as to whether or not that means this game holds up is entirely up to you, but I genuinely thought that Klonoa was a fun game with a lot going for it. However, I also think that whether or not a game holds up can sometimes be a bit more complex than whether or not the game is still fun, as the platformer landscape we find ourselves in these days is very different from the one that the original game was released in. After all, 2D platformers were kinda considered a bit old-fashioned back in the day. Thanks to advances in technology, developers and gamers alike had seemingly moved past the genre and had become more interested in what platformers were capable of in a 3D space, something that Klonoa just barely shows an interest in. And while it was able to stand out back in the day due to the simple fact that it was one of few console platformers that decided to be 2D, the simple fact of the matter is that we now live in an era where the genre has gone through something of a second renaissance thanks to the number of high quality releases from major developers and indie devs alike. So, even if Klonoa does hold up and is every bit as fun and inspired as it was back in the day, that doesn't necessarily mean it'll hold up to the current standard for the genre. And just for fun, does Klonoa's take on platforming remain fresh enough to warrant a quote-unquote proper revival in the form of new entries or re-releases of its portable games? And if Namco is planning on bringing the series back for new games, what are some changes that could be made to potentially breathe new life into the series? Before we continue though, a quick question of the day. What do you consider when you think about whether or not a game holds up? Do you look at the objective quality of the game on its own merits, or do you compare it to how more modern titles handle similar ideas? Do you think about it purely on a level of whether or not the game is fun, or do you think there's a bit more to it? Be sure to leave your answer to the question of the day over in the comments. I'd love to hear your answer. And if you're new here and are enjoying what you see so far, feel free to subscribe to the channel and stuff so that you can check out all the other videos I'll be putting out in the future. On top of that, feel free to support my channel via donation or subscription on Buy Me A Coffee or Patreon if you want to access a few bonus goodies and to help me make more videos. And with that out of the way, on with the video. Alright, so starting with the original PlayStation release, each of the game's levels revolve around the platforming staple of getting from point A to B without dying and features a few puzzles thrown into each of them to keep things from growing stale. Though I use the term puzzles very loosely here as they never really go beyond finding and flipping switches or finding ways to get to areas that you can't reach with normal jumps and such. Thankfully, Klonoa's got a few tricks up his sleeve that, while seemingly inspired by a few of gaming's icons that predate him, help him stand out and get things done. For example, he can doggy paddle in the air to get some extra air time in his jumps that's a bit like a nerfed version of Kirby's flying ability or Yoshi's flutter jump. Plus, he's got this magic ring that allows him to grab enemies and use them as projectiles or to perform a double jump to reach higher areas. It's neat, makes the game feel unique, and it reminds me of how Wayne Knight's character was disposed of in Space Jam. Ew. 
Oh, and it also reminds me of Dig Dug 2 thanks to how that game revolves around inflating enemies. Which kinda makes me wonder whether or not that was intentional seeing as this game was made by Namco. Because after all, it wouldn't be that surprising if it was given the fact that Pac-Man's literally on the character's cap and stuff. And while we're on the subject of inspirations and all, I wonder if Hideo Yoshizawa was inspired by Yoshi at all when it came to Klonoa's jumping ability. After all, Yoshi's Island only came out a few years before this one did and also prominently featured a flutter jump in its main character's arsenal. Heck, you could even joke that being able to sacrifice Yoshi in Super Mario World for a double jump was the inspiration for Klonoa being able to do the same thing in this game. That's probably just a coincidence, right? Aside from that, each of the game's six worlds feature a boss battle that usually takes place in a cylindrical stage of some kind and honestly reminds me of the boss battles from Nights into Dreams. Several of the stages also feature perspective shifts to make use of the fifth generation of gaming's coveted Z-axis in order to see what all the hubbub's about. It all makes for a really fun and varied experience that totally reflects the fact that this game was made in the generation that succeeded the golden age of platformers. You can tell that Namco really thought about their work here and that they did their homework when it came to sculpting the game's stages and challenges. In the same way that a renaissance apprentice may have studied and emulated the greats in order to ensure their art could stand alongside it, Klonoa feels like a platformer that was made by a team that had kept an eye on what the masters of the 2D platformer had cooked up over the years and were determined to at least match that in quality. For a game released in the midst of the first wave of 3D platformers, Klonoa's strong 2D gameplay is among the few examples of a game going against the of the era and coming out stronger because of it. And honestly, we probably needed more 2D platformers for home consoles back in the late 90s, so it's awesome that we got such a great one from Namco to begin with. I especially enjoyed the fact that unlike in other platformers, enemies respawn in specific areas after you've disposed of them. This happens whenever an enemy is required to solve any of the game's challenges and is a great touch on the part of the developer due to the simple fact that it stops you from accidentally soft locking the game. It's the little touches like that and the use of depth in the game's level designs that really help Klonoa stand out for me. Plus, the game has really great and simple controls that are easy to pick up and master, leading to the game feeling really approachable for players of all ages. It isn't perfect, mind you, but I genuinely felt comfortable with this game and with its platforming, aside from some tighter jumps towards the end of it and the fact that depth perception and aiming can sometimes be a bit disorienting. That could just be me, though. It's obvious after just a few moments with it that Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle is a great title that nails the fundamentals and uses light puzzle solving as a means to help differentiate it from the games that came before it. Now that I have the basic gameplay out of the way though, I thought it would be a good idea to switch gears for a bit and to touch on the game's story. After all, Hideo Yoshizawa did express an interest in telling a more cinematic story than what's usually expected from the genre, and as such, it may actually be worth taking a look at it to see how well a job he did with it. Before we continue though, I'd just like to throw in a brief disclaimer that the following section is mostly my opinion and that it's purely subjective. The last thing that I want to do is have a bunch of longtime fans of the game and series think that I'm just like napalming their childhood by like not liking it because I do see the appeal of Klonoa at the end of the day. Like I do like the game. And like, yes, I could hypothetically just focus in on the parts I really liked about the game and ignore the stuff I didn't like. Frankly, that's what I did while I was playing the game. But that feels really disingenuous and more like lip service that the game really doesn't need. Anyway, I know I probably didn't need to dive into a disclaimer like this and all, but I just wanted to make sure people got that because I'm really not trying to offend anybody as I know this was a huge part of like a bunch of people's childhoods. If you want a different opinion from the one I'm about to share about this game and its story, not that it's that spicy of an opinion as far as I'm concerned, you should totally check out Chase Face's video on the subject. It'll hopefully be linked in a card that's appearing on the screen right about now, and it's a really great video about the game. It's made by a guy who grew up with it and has a much deeper connection to it than I could ever pretend to have. So yeah, I mean, it's there if you want it. All right, so disclaimer over, let's dive into things. 
To be a little blunt, Door to Phantom Isle's story is a pretty simple tale of good versus evil with a narrative arc that feels like it was plucked out of a Saturday morning cartoon and honestly works fairly well within the basic structure of Joseph Campbell's monomyth. Or as many a person on the internet started to refer to it as over the years, the Rick and Morty guy's story circle. Without completely derailing this video for a fun jaunt through the history of storytelling and the formulas that propel it, the Kimbellian monomyth, or hero's journey as it's more commonly known, is basically a template for storytelling that lays out a clear structure wherein a hero must leave the comforts of their known world to go on a grand quest to vanquish an evil that threatens to disrupt it in most cases, grows as a person, and then returns back to where they started having grown all the stronger because of it. Despite being a little controversial due to how easy it is to shove just about any story into its structure, it's the backbone for many a modern blockbuster, many non-serialized stories on television, and has tempted many a burgeoning narrative writer over the years. Young man, what is this? So why am I bringing this up to you and why does it matter? Well, because Klonoa's story fits into it really well, and the emphasis placed on the game's story within the title itself is unfortunately responsible for making that fact stand out. That's not to say that it's a bad thing though, as I totally see the appeal of the story and I somewhat get why people seem to like it so much. It's just that the execution left me feeling a bit high and dry after learning that this was intended to be an example of cinematic storytelling within a platformer. When it comes to platformers, I feel like cinematic or any type of more involved storytelling is something that should probably stay on the back burner lest it wants to run the risk of potentially alienating its audience. In order to be memorable, these stories often feel like they either have to be absolutely nailed in order to be genuinely captivating or need to fail so spectacularly that they can elicit fascination. Essentially, it needs to stand out, which is something that I feel that Door to Phantom Isle's story didn't, at least for me. Many of the game's levels begin and end with cutscenes that, while perfectly functional within the context of the story and charming within their own right, kind of fail to keep my attention. Something that's not due to the game's lack of voice acting either, as the Wii version features voice acting over the game's made-up language from the original and is actually worse for it. It's simply that the dialogue wasn't that interesting for me. It felt like it had been constrained to do the bare minimum due to also needing to be graspable for younger kids to understand, and while that makes sense from a sales point of view, I can't shake the sense that it ultimately held the game itself back. Take a game like Sonic Adventure, for instance. The cutscenes and story in Sonic Adventure 1 are an absolute fever dream when laid out in their separate parts. It feels like a blend of shonen anime tropes with mystical legends shoehorned into the picture that's held together by some truly bonkers late 90s animation, which I can't get enough of. Oh yeah! This is happening! And on the other side of the spectrum, there's a game like Psychonauts. This game is also a platformer, and it's a surprisingly well-crafted and told story for the era it came out in about mental health with hilariously written comedy and strong animation that improves its story and characterization. Both of these games show that when telling a cinematic story in a platformer, you still need to make sure that your story is interesting and does a little more than simply check off all of the boxes on a 3-5 to five act structure. And while Sonic Adventure's story is a bit disjointed and often lacking in its execution, it shows that being that way can still work. That, to borrow the title of a Shel Silverstein poem and book, you can still find yourself falling up. It also shows that in order to make the most of what I think Yoshizawa was aiming for with this game, it needs a bit more flair in its execution. More than that, it needs a hook to help justify the amount of story in the game compared to the gameplay. It needs more... Malodrama. Okay, so without diving into story spoilers, because I want to preserve some semblance of this game's story for you guys in case you decide to go experience it yourselves, I know this game has melodrama in it, and I know that a lot of people don't care for excessive amounts of it in their stories to begin with, but I feel like truly ratcheting up the characterizations and reactions of everyone in this game up to 11 would have gone a long way in making the story more gripping. And apologies because I tend to cut to or mention the work of David Lynch a lot on my channel, I mean he's one of my favorite directors directors of all time, so go figure, but his work on Twin Peaks is some of the finest examples of overly melodramatic performances in media, and it's exactly what I think this game could use. I'm not afraid of any damn funeral. Afraid? I can hardly wait. Afraid? I'm 
gonna turn it upside down! The melodramatic performances and character reactions in the show are a perfect embodiment of the human experience, and because both Twin Peaks and a lot of David Lynch's work in general is informed by surrealism and dreams, I think it would have been pretty compatible with Klonoa. We live inside a dream. And it's raining post-toasties. Hell, God, baby, damn no! I hope that didn't come across as overly critical or snobby on my part, because on a beat-by-beat -beat basis, the game's story does work and it does have charm. It's just that it also felt a bit undercooked, and at least for me, more like padding to the gameplay than something that could stand on its own. One of the things I couldn't help but notice about the game's cutscenes and story beats was that it always felt like a hard stop to the gameplay. Like I was being forced to switch gears before I was ready to as a player. Essentially, the game hadn't done enough to make me actually care about the goings on in the story, and I think this is at least in part due to the reliance on the monomyth for its structure. Going back to my Renaissance comparison from earlier, it felt like it was a bit too focused on emulating the quote unquote ideal form of the masters that it forgot to have an identity of its own. The story felt like it was going through each of the beats of the hero's journey as opposed to just letting the writing breathe a little. And in doing so, it became a bit formulaic. Don't get me wrong though, because again, I do think that the game's story does work and the monomyth has become as deconstructed as it has over the years for a reason. It's just that I feel as though it didn't necessarily work well enough to warrant the priority that was placed on it in the game. As is, it's harmless enough though, so long as you don't mind the interruptions to the gameplay that the cutscenes often bring to the table. But for me, it was just a bit too much to handle due to the simple fact that there's something like 45 minutes of cutscenes in a game that's only about four or five hours long if you're taking your time with it. Anyway, seeing as I've probably railed against this game enough for one lifetime, let's move on to the positive aspects of it again because like, I did ultimately like it. Even though I didn't personally care for this game's story, there's also no denying that it is cinematic and that it has some great blocking and emoting from its characters for the era. After all, telling a good story doesn't necessarily equate to being cinematic, nor does being cinematic mean that you need to have a good, deep, or compelling story to begin with. There's probably a Zack Snyder joke in there somewhere, but God knows I won't make it. Either way, once you get past what the game isn't, you can focus in on the fact that Door to Phantom Isle does a really great job of encapsulating the story that it wants to tell. It's got this bright, bouncy art style to it, and I'm absolutely crazy about the juxtaposition of well-drawn 32-bit character sprites against a low-poly environment. I feel like I often mention the fact that I'd love to see more games adopt the sort of low-polygon art style found in games from this era, and, well, this is exactly why. Klonoa's art has this amazing aesthetic going for it, and I genuinely think it owes a lot of that to the era it was made in. It just gives off this amazing, and fittingly enough dreamlike quality to it that you can't easily get from more modern graphics. It's got these adorable and lovable sprite designs, smooth animations, and makes good, clean use of some of the PlayStation's horsepower in the form of transparency effects and some rotation-y stuff in a way that's really immersive and easy on the eyes. Plus, it's got a genuinely fantastic soundtrack that hops from genre to genre with an ease usually reserved for a Prince album. Klonoa's OST has everything from the expected bouncy pop music to some more intense stuff balanced against more moody and ambient numbers, and even features drum and bass music for one of its character themes. And like, you'd think D&B would feel a bit out of place on a colorful Namco platformer for kids, but it totally doesn't and only affirms that Klonoa was the fire starter all along. Door to Phantom Isle has some of the cleanest presentation I've ever seen in a platformer, and I genuinely mean that from the bottom of my heart. It barely misses a beat, and my biggest complaints against it come down to simple preference on my part. I would have liked to see the game's art style go all in on the dream imagery that its premise lends itself towards. Due to the simple fact that this game's location is a world made by the waking world's dreams, I guess I just would have preferred the world of Klonoa to be a bit stranger and more nonsensical in its visual design. For example, there's a great instance of the game relying on dream logic in one of its stages by featuring a waterfall that works in reverse. Stuff like this is pretty par for the course in dreams, which are often unintuitive and divorced from the way things should work in the real world, and it would have been a great opportunity for the developers to throw some awe-inspired stage designs our way that made use of that logic or lack thereof, but, well, I mean, it kind of does, especially towards the back half of the game and all, but, uh, I just would have liked more of it. 
Mentioning nights again, especially since it also takes place in a dream world, it just would have been nice to see things like the character designs get a little weirder and more evocative in their execution. And who knows, maybe a bit more dreamlike surrealism would have lent itself towards a deeper and more thematic narrative. Because dreams are a fun and playful construct that can be used as a literal playground for strange and striking art due to the fact that dreams don't play by the same rules as in the waking world. I know better than anyone else that my particular interests are, and excuse the unintentional wordplay, a bit niche. I'm a goofy, potentially pretentious, and even more potentially okay with it film graduate that watches David Lynch and likes to read psychology and philosophy for fun. So of course I'd want this game to be more surreal and feature more dream imagery. Like, no duh. However, I'm not saying that Klonoa completely fails at conjuring dream imagery, but rather that its current presentation doesn't feel distinct enough in its commitment to that idea. Even though a lot of this game's locations definitely feel removed from reality, it doesn't feel far enough away from what you might see in a Mario game to truly stand out as taking place in a dream. That doesn't mean that I didn't like what we got here though, because Klonoa's a great looking game and I can totally see why Namco went with the art style that they did for it. After all, it's a cutesy platformer for kids and adults, so they probably wanted to keep things on the tame side and make sure it wasn't nightmare fuel. To which I say, yeah, mission accomplished. They've got a total chef's kiss on their hands. Regardless of it coming across as more cartoony than dreamy, I get where its creators are coming from with it, respect their desire to do what they did here, and I understand that my point comes down to simple preference on my part. So let's dive back into the gameplay for a bit and explore some of those layers that I left unattended to earlier in this review. For starters, even though Door to Phantom Isle's gameplay is a genuine blast that masterfully mixes clean platforming with light puzzle action, I have a somewhat similar complaint to the one I shared regarding its dreamlike environment. Simply put, the gameplay loop's potential feels somewhat unrealized due to how generally easy Klonoa is. Regardless of the fact that the game is really well designed, so much of it feels trapped in a light jog when it could be in a nice sprint, so to speak. I didn't dislike the fact that the game was easy or anything, but it just kind of left me wanting more because I loved its premise and because the final levels of the game do ramp up the difficulty by a bit and start to show off a harder take on the game that feels like it would have made for a great experience. In its current form though, Klonoa's levels just kinda unfurl themselves in a mostly linear fashion. Even the game's deliberately unlinear moments sort of play out as if they're on rails due to the simple fact that their seeming open-endedness feels mostly inconsequential and way too guided to feel like you're actually making your own path. And while this is in part due to the fact that this is a 2.5D platformer and can't truly allow you to go it's still frustrating nonetheless. I understand that this game's for kids and stuff, and that, as such, Namco probably wanted to keep it easy and accessible, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the game had to hand itself over to the player on a platter the way it often feels like it does. I think a great franchise to compare this one to would be HAL Laboratory's Kirby games. Much like Door to Phantom Isle, Kirby games tend to be extremely easy and don't really put an emphasis on challenge as opposed to emphasizing a cozy adventure through a cute and whimsical world instead. But unlike Kirby games, I feel like Klonoa's gameplay actually needed some additional challenge. Kirby's copy-laced platforming works as well as it does because it's as easy or hard as you want it to be. By being able to hoover duders like their fooders, players are able to tune their experience in a Kirby game on the fly, which is both deeply satisfying and a slick way to make sure that the game's balanced enough for players of all ages to get in on the fun. But Klonoa, on the other hand, really only works on a singular level as a game due to the simple fact that his ring abilities can't be adjusted in the same way that Kirby's abilities can. As such, in order to be playable by kids and adults alike, it needs to rely on simply being an easy game with a very slowly rising difficulty curve. Likewise, the game does a great job of introducing a few different mechanics to you and combining them into challenges that call for different skills to get used in order to claim victory, but it also waits a bit too long for its own good before actually putting you into those situations. Sure, the bosses in the game are definitely harder than the levels leading up to them are, but they still aren't that hard, and the game's also forgiving when it comes to death and extra lives, so even more inexperienced players should be able to get through the title's challenges without much fuss eventually. It also could have just been, um, longer. 
All right, so I recognize the slight irony in me, a person who typically actually enjoys when games are a bit on the shorter side, wishing that this one were longer, but at just around four or so hours long, Klonoa is a really short game. Plus, once you factor in the fact that the game has 45 minutes of cutscenes like I mentioned earlier, you're actually left with just over three or so hours of gameplay when playing at a fairly leisurely pace. I won't pretend that's an exact estimate or anything, but still, the game ends just when it feels like it could have been getting started, and regardless of the fact that the overall length of the adventure feels well paced for the story it's trying to tell, it still leaves you wanting more levels to experience anyway. And this isn't really helped by the fact that, due to the relatively low difficulty curve, it's just a bit too easy to mindlessly consume this game without stopping to soak in the ambience that it has to offer. I think you guys get the point by now though. Ultimately, Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle is a fantastic 2D platformer that came out at a time when 2D platformers were a thing of the past. It's got the triple threat of great and accessible level designs, wonderful 32-bit graphics, and an amazing soundtrack. But on the other, more subjective side though, it's also an extremely short game with a bit of a simple story that takes up more time in a playthrough than I was personally comfortable with, and its extremely low difficulty left me wanting more. There was something missing. But, how about the remake? Released in 2008 for the Nintendo Wii, Door to Phantom Isle's remake, which pulled a Rambo and simply called itself Klonoa this time around, throws a fresh coat of paint on the PlayStation original and came out at a very choice time for platformers. It could be argued that the late 2000s and early 2010s was the beginning of a second renaissance for 2D platformers. Even though we were still being graced from the heavens with 3D classics like Super Mario Galaxy or the earlier days of Sonic's boost formula in games like Sonic Unleashed and Sonic Colors, 2D platformers had begun to make waves again in the public eye. This was due to several factors that I'm not really going to dive that far into detail about, but we'll basically summarize as new Super Mario Bros showing that there was still a market for those kinds of games, coupled with the burgeoning indie scene putting out 2D bangers by the bucket load. Plus, thanks to the Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS, and even the PSP to some extent, it's not like the genre had ever truly gone away to begin with. And seeing as the Nintendo Wii was a literal printing press when it came to games for kids and families, I guess it only made sense for Namco to try and give Klonoa another shot at primetime. And in terms of how fun the game itself is, the 2008 iteration of Klonoa is pretty great, and that's mostly because it's just the 1997 original with a new coat of paint thrown on it. While there may actually be some difference between the PS1 and Wii versions of the game as far as its physics and stage designs go, they're so minimal at best that it wouldn't be that surprising if this turned out to just be more of an updated port of the game as opposed to a proper remake. You remember the GTA Definitive Edition debacle from late 2021? Well, aside from the fact that the Klonoa remake didn't launch with a bunch of game-breaking bugs and stuff, it honestly kind of reminds me of it. Much like that release of Grand Theft Auto 3, Vice City, and San Andreas, this version of the game is more or less just the original Klonoa with a few minor quality of life updates and a new art style. And similarly, these changes got a bit of a mixed reaction from me. Starting with the new art style, it goes all in on the cartoony aesthetic of the original, but updates it to fit something more becoming of the late 2000s. And regardless of the fact that there's nothing inherently wrong with doing that, its results are somewhat mixed and generally feels inferior to what was on display in the original. Klonoa's new design looks fine on its own merits, but kinda reminds me of the way that Sega had gradually redesigned Sonic the Hedgehog over the course of the 2000s, stretching his proportions out until he looked more like a victim of a medieval rack than he had back in the 90s. The Stretch Armstrongification of Sonic, if you will. And as if that weren't enough, a lot of the environments in the game also took a hit due to being redesigned with new assets. While they also look fine and fairly faithful to the original on a design level, it almost feels like some of these areas lost some of their character in the process of having more detail added to them. I can't really hold this against the developers, since there was simply no way Namco wouldn't have done this, but it feels like updating the game's graphics for this remake manages to pull Klonoa further away from encompassing that dreamy quality that its premise was going for, and that's on top of the fact that the original game didn't really cash in on that idea as much as I would have liked it to to begin with. Instead, this version of Klonoa feels especially cartoony in its execution, to the point of swapping out the original game's made-up Phantom Isle language for plain old voice acting that feels straight out of a Sonic game. How sometimes when you wake up, 
You know you had a dream, but you can't remember it. Why does he sound like Sonic the Hedgehog? Even though you can switch the language back to the original one from the PlayStation game, this choice somewhat telegraphs the idea that Namco was more interested in rebooting Klonoa for a newer, younger audience as opposed to catering to the fans of the original game and its sequels. Which is something that's made even more abundantly clear once you look at this game's other changes, which includes doubling your health and making the game's bosses easier than they were in the PlayStation game. These changes feel extremely unnecessary due to the fact that the original game wasn't that hard to begin begin with, as well as the fact that its gameplay hadn't really aged over the years on account of how it came out after 2D platformers had all been but perfected as a genre. I think I just spoiled this video. Well, we had a good run. It also isn't helped by the fact that the game doesn't add much in the form of additional content for longtime fans either. Even something like a special hard mode or even just a handful of new levels to really test the player's skills would have helped tide things over. But uh, no, you don't get any of that aside from a bonus level for finding all the collectibles in the game, which was in the original one too, and a reverse mode which is just the normal game played backwards. And that's not to say that I even dislike this version of the game either, or that I think it's even that bad. In fact, if it weren't for the fact that there's another re-release of it that's about to come out with its sequel attached, I'd probably have recommended this to people looking to play the game on real hardware since it's cheaper than the PlayStation 1 and plays almost identically to it. Plus, while I didn't care for the new art style, I don't think it's ugly or unappealing to look at. It's just that it looks a bit generic and lost some of the defining 32 bit chunk that I loved in the original. If anything, my biggest issue with this version of Klonoa is that it feels like it came out at a time when platformers were just starting to become a hot ticket item again and didn't have anything new or of substance to bring to the table. And while that might have worked for something like Super Mario Bros. All-Stars back in the day, that game also happens to have been a pack-in title and came out at the beginning of the golden age of platformers, so it gets a bit of a pass there when this one doesn't. Klonoa came out right within the same 3-4 to four year window that brought us New Super Mario Bros, Donkey Kong Country Returns, Sonic Colors, and Kirby's Return to Dream Land. Four games that, with the partial exception to Sonic Colors because that's also a 3D title, all focused on returning to their basic series formulas for a brand new adventure, to the point of the word return literally being in the title of two of the games to begin with. But unlike those games, Klonoa's 2008 remake is just… Klonoa. A point that's made abundantly clear by the fact that this release even dropped the Door to Phantom Isle subtitle from the title entirely. And even though this is still a great game 10 years after its original release, it feels like a bare-bones re-release that's been prettied up to try and compete with newer games on the market, and unfortunately kind of fails at it. So does Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle hold up? Well its gameplay hadn't really aged over the years on account of how it came out after 2D platformers had all been but perfected as a genre. Uh -huh. At the end of the day, Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle is a really, really good game. It's got some great PS1 era visuals, a varied and memorable soundtrack, and a main gameplay hook that's still every bit unique now as it was 25 years ago. And even though the Wii remake loses some of the original's charm thanks to its updated visuals, it's still a good game that manages to be every bit as fun as the original was, even though it's perplexingly easier than the PS1 version. However, while Klonoa may hold up in the sense that it's still an utter and complete blast to play through, it's also a game that left me wishing for a lot more out of it. Because of its low difficulty, this first Klonoa game felt more like a warm-up for the real thing, and even though I'm really accommodating towards easy easier games and usually even prefer some of them to harder ones in many cases, Klonoa's gameplay loop had so much potential that it felt hyperbolically criminal not to make use of it. And that wasted potential is a huge part of why so much of this video probably came across as negative on some level. Because the game is genuinely great, but it feels like it's being held back by not going all in on its strongest parts. I get that Hideo Yoshizawa was interested in trying to tell a story that would appeal to kids and adults alike and make a functional platformer in the process, but at least where I'm coming from, it feels like the game's design was begging for a longer, harder adventure than a fully fleshed out story. And even though Klonoa's story is functional, well paced, and has its charms, it almost feels as though the game would have either needed to commit to telling a more compelling and resonant story, at the risk of losing some of its younger players, or alternatively 
effectively would have needed to leave its story as is or simplified it while expanding on the design and gameplay. So yeah, Klonoa does hold up, but it also feels held back in a few ways that may affect some player's ability to enjoy it. And after playing through both versions of the game and sitting on my thoughts on them for a few weeks, as well as looking at the current landscape of platformers, I thought it'd be fun to try and figure out what my ideal Klonoa reboot would be like. Before I do though, bear in mind that I'm not a game designer, nor am I a programmer. And it's also worth stating that this is just my dream version of the game. If Namco does end up making a new Klonoa game, based off the fact that they're using the Wii remake from 2008 for this re-release they're doing, well, you can kind of infer that they're gonna stick to what they know and that Klonoa will continue to be an extremely cutesy game for kids first and foremost. Basically, this is all just for fun, so, you know, let's try and have some. Right off the bat, I like to think that my ideal Klonoa game is one that would really go all in on the surrealist and often absurdist nature of dreams. The game would open up in some sort of black and white factory that looks as though it would feel right at home in the movie Eraserhead, and in it we'd see Klonoa beside a floating teapot and a framed picture of shamed US President Herbert Hoover who's lamenting his inability to stop the Great Depression from ravaging America and the cropping up of so-called Hoovervilles in many a public area. Suddenly, we'd snap to a close-up of Klonoa's lips just as he says, And... <laughs> just kidding. Honestly, my ideal Klonoa game is one that would put its gameplay and the development of it above all else. While I'd also prefer it to go back to a low-poly aesthetic or even full-on pixel art, so long as the gameplay itself is intact, made harder, and maybe even sped up, I'll probably be a happy camper. The harder moments towards the end of the first game really reminded me of my experience playing Celeste for the first time last summer in terms of how satisfying it was to make my way from area to area in it, and frankly, I feel like that'd be a potentially interesting direction to take the series in. What if instead of giving us six relatively large worlds with two levels apiece in them, we got a game that gave us a huge number of smaller stages to run through and perfect? Something that played a bit more like Celeste or Super Meat Boy, albeit with Klonoa's general art style and storytelling mechanics. And yeah, I'd still put a story in this thing too. While I personally wasn't that attached to the one in this game, I do realize that people enjoy it and that a new Klonoa would want to appeal to them too. If I had complete control over the game, I'd probably want the story to try a different template for its beats or to maybe try handling something a little more introspective than a simple stop the evil person from mucking up the world since it's about dreams and stuff, but honestly, I don't really live or die by stories in video games to begin with, so that's really up to the developers. And last, I'd either ditch the voice acting wholesale or bury it in the menu, kind of like an inverse of what happened in the Wii version. Heck, if the developers wanted to get especially ballsy, I'd ditch the need for language in the game entirely and use emotive animation to tell the story instead. I know that sounds like a tall order, but seeing as dreams are meant to be interpreted, that just kind of feels like a good way to make the experience more subjective and up to the player to interpret for themselves. So to summarize, Klonoa's a great game, and if you haven't played it before, you can't really go wrong with any release of it. Even though I just beat the game twice for this video in the span of like a week and a half, I'm still planning on picking up the Switch release, and I may end up playing through the first game again on that version. Although I'll probably just play the second game first because like, I just beat the game twice, dude. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and do all that YouTube social engagement stuff if you want to help the channel grow, and to leave an answer to the question of the day if you haven't already. On top of that, you could also leave me a tip on my Buy Me A Coffee or subscribe to my Buy Me A Coffee and Patreon for some bonus goodies. Links to those are in the pinned comment and in the description. You could also check me out on social media by looking up at Niche Plays on Twitter and Instagram, or by, again, following the links in the description. And if you aren't sick of my voice yet, you could also check out my podcast, Media Obscura. It's a retro movie and TV review podcast hosted by myself alongside my girlfriend Sierra and my best friend Raekwon. We do an episode at least once a month, sometimes twice, and I don't know, man, like... It's a pretty chill show, I think. If you're into people bantering, talking about movies, talking about life, and probably making fun of me in the process, it's your kind of show. So yeah, bye.